So, uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, a warm welcome to our episode 3, number 88. And this is the second uh, episode in our cataract module of iFocus Online. And today, uh, I would like to extend a warm welcome to our presenter, Dr. Pratiksha Sharma, who is a consultant at Center for Sight uh, Revari Haryana. And the moderator for the session is uh, Dr. Pranita Sahai. And I will be the chairperson. So we are happy to have a few PG students and DNB students also with us. And I will uh, extend a warm welcome to Dr. Ash Ashwita, Dr. Ishita, and Dr. Purva. And the topic for today's uh, class will be etiology of cataract, pathogenesis, classification, and grading systems. So now I would request uh, Dr. Pranita to introduce Dr. Pratiksha to the audience. Thank you, Dr. Jaita. Uh, so hi, everyone, and welcome to this uh, CATRAC uh, episode two. And uh, let me introduce our uh, wonderful speaker for the day. So Dr. Pratiksha Sharma, who's going to be presenting this uh, uh, class on CATRAC etiology, classification, and grading system. She's done an MBBS from the prestigious Lady Harding Medical College in Delhi. And subsequently, she did her post-graduation and senior residency from Guru Nanak Eye Center at Maulana Zad Medical College. Currently, she is an associate consultant in Center for Sight Eye Hospital, and she has previous experience of working at the, the ESI Hospital as well. She is a recipient of the Champions Award at the UC session and has authored over 30 journal articles and given over 40 presentations and lectures at various ophthalmic meetings of national and international level. So we welcome you all, Dr. Pratiksha, for... Uh, uh, for this interesting session on cataract. Over to you, Dr. Pratiksha. So, thank you, Dr. Pranita. Thank you, Dr. Jaita, for introducing me. And thank you, CFS, for providing me this opportunity to talk on the topic of etiology of cataract along with pathogenesis, um, classification, and grading. So, I'll just start my topic. Can you see my slide? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So I'm here to present the etiology of cataract, pathogenesis, classification, and grading systems. So starting with introduction. Although we have revised uh, about cataract yesterday, the anatomy, the day before yesterday about the anatomy and physiology, but here I will just uh, point out few important things about the lens. So natural lens is a crystalline lens which is made up of protein and water that gives a clear passage for light. So cataract, how do we define cataract? We all know what is cataract, but how do we actually define so cataract is defined as opacity of the clear lens, which reduces the amount of light entering the eye. As a result, it uh, leads to deterioration of the vision. Cataract is the leading cause of blindness all over the world, as we all know, and it is also the dominant cause of socio-medical problems. So why are we discussing this topic? Why is it so important to discuss about the etiology of the cataract? Because we have only two solutions to um, this cataract. Either we go for surgical extraction of the cataract lens, but the burden is so much and we all know that all surgeries are not sight restoring. So what else can we do for that? So we have another option that is prevention. Prevention is always better than cure. So what can we do to prevent the cataract? We can always identify the factors. So there are always some modifiable factors which can be identified and can be modified. When these factors are modified, it leads to delay in onset and progression of the cataract. As a result, uh, the burden on the society, the burden, uh, the economical burden is reduced. So that is why we are going to study the etiological factors in great details. So coming to the first factor is the genetic factors. So we can see one third of all the cataracts are due to genetic factors and this is due to anomaly in the chromosomal pattern. So there are various associations along with these cataract like microphthalmia, retinal degenerations, aniridia, anterior chamber developmental anomalies. Also, there are certain syndromes which are associated with this like Lewis syndrome, neurofibromatosis. 
Also, we have seen PITX3 gene is responsible for inherited cataract with anterior segment mesenchymal dysgenesis. Then coming to the maternal and fetal factors. So, the maternal malnutrition during pregnancy as well as during early infancy can lead to non-familial zonular cataract. So, what are the various maternal? We have, we have talked about the malnutrition. Now, coming to maternal infections which can lead to cataract. So, maternal infections like rubella toxoplasmosis and cytomegalovirus can again lead to cataract in the child. Then, other maternal causes include endocrine disturbances, use of alcohol and drug during pregnancy, also radiation exposure. Now, coming to the infantile factors, we have intrauterine hypoxia, especially in the last trimester of pregnancy. Then, um, kids suffering from Lewy syndrome, myotonic dystrophy, congenital ichthyosis, also the Asaka variant of galactokinesis with A198B substitution. So, these are among the various factors which are very important and modifiable. Then coming to gender, women are more prone than men. Why is it so? Because of the lack of estrogen in the postmenopausal years. Uh, in the coming slides, I will also point it out that there are estrogen receptors seen on the capsule. So that is why in the absence of estrogen, the females are more prone to develop uh, cataract. Then coming to race, race and ethnicity, risk in double in Africa and Americans. Uh, other Americans as compared to the Occasions. This is due to uh, lack of availability of the medical um, treatment and uh, more diabetes among these races are uh, cause of cataract in such races. Then uh, very important, aging. So aging, age itself is related to cataract. Uh, there may or may not be some mechanical, chemical or radiational trauma. Age itself is a risk factor. Cataract always progresses with age and factors which may provoke the above mechanism for uh, development of cataract includes diarrhea or dehydration crisis. So, one episode of severe diarrhea, it is seen that single episode of severe diarrhea is 4.1 times more likely to cause cataract. The risk increases to 21% with two or more episodes of diarrhea. Then there are other associations which can increase the or early progression of cataract occurs if uh, um, it is uh, we have associated malnutrition, acidosis, high level of urea, osmotic balance effect, glutathione levels and hence cause cataract. Also if with aging, if we have hypertension, this high arterial pressure leads to decreased lenticular ionic transport resulting in decreased Sodium potassium adenosine triphosphatase activity in the epithelium leading to cataract. Then smoking, two to three times fold increased risk of cataract is seen in smokers. Oxidative stress, oxygen free radicals. As we all know that we have oxygen free radicals in our body, we also have scavengers for this. But oxidative process always rises with age in human lens, leading to oxidation of the protein, concentration of the protein and ultimately leading to cataract. Lipid content and cholesterol. So, this is highest amount of cholesterol content present in the lens membrane. Increased accumulation and redistribution of cholesterol inside the cell can lead to cataract. On the other hand, hypocholesterolemic drugs like statins, they can block the cholesterol accumulation in the lens membrane and again lead to redistribution of the cholesterol. It can, itself can also lead to formation of cataract. Then comes the traumatic cause. So, the trauma can be a blunt trauma or it can be a penetrating trauma. So, in the capsule, if there is a breach, then inner lens swells with water and turns white due to the saturation of the lens protein. If there is no breach, then subcapsular cataract and star-shaped cataracts are seen. Then complicated cataracts. So, what is complicated cataracts? Cataracts that are secondary to local eye infection or systemic inflammatory disease or degenerative disease. These three together, they constitute the complicated cataracts. So, what are the diseases? So, local eye diseases we have seen. Then we have systemic inflammatory disease. Also, we have degenerative disease. So, talking about the various diseases, first comes the skin disease and allergies. So, cataracts are associated with cutaneous diseases is known as syndromatotic cataracts. It occurs at young age. They are bilateral. Atopic cataract means the cataracts which are most commonly associated with atopic dermatitis. 
Other disorders include poikiloderma, vascular tropicans, scleroderma, keratotis, uh, follicularis. Then we have eye conditions which lead to formation of cataract. So glaucoma itself along with the treatment of glaucoma can cause cataract. The treatment includes drugs like myotics and filtering surgeries. So glaucoma plus its treatment direct is directly linked to formation of cataract. Then we have inflammatory conditions like uveitis, corneal ulcer, endophthalmitis, myopic chorioretinal degenerations, retinitis pigmentosa, retinal dystrophies, retinoblastoma, melanoma. All these conditions can lead to formation of cataract. Then we come to metabolic causes. So, what are the metabolic causes due to endocrine disorders and biomechanical abnormalities? These lead to formation of cataract. One most important example is diabetes. The other is galactosemia. So, coming to galactosemia, deficiency of the enzyme galactose 1-phosphate uridyl transferase. Also, the deficiency of galactokinase leads to formation of galactosemia, causing a bilateral cataract and which is also oil droplet cataract. Coming to diabetes, we all know that hyperglycemia leads to non-enzymatic protein glycations, osmotic stress and oxidative stress leading to form accumulation of protein inside the um, lens and leading to formation of cataract. Hypocalcemia is associated usually with parathyroid technique. Multicolored crystals, small discrete white flakes of punctate opacities are formed inside the capsular region of the lens which never matures. So these are the characteristic of a hypocalcemic cataract. Then hypothyroidism. Although it is not so common, but opacities usually resemble like those in hypoparathyroidism. Then error of copper metabolism. So hepatolenticular degeneration or Wilson's disease. Opacity is seen in the anterior capsular region, brightly colored sunflower pattern, usually green in color, but it rarely affects the vision. And it is associated with KF ring. Then we have nutritional causes. So deficiency of micronutrients can cause cataract. So what are those micronutrients? Like tryptophan deficiency, low folic acid, zinc and copper deficiency. Other factors like neonatal hypoglycemia, minoacidic homocystinuria, Febris disease, Hurler disease and Lewis syndrome can also cause cataract. Coming to toxic cataract. So what are the toxic cataract? So cataract which are due to Drug abuses. So, what are the drugs that lead to formation of cataract? So, drugs like corticosteroids, tranquilizers, radiometric drugs, phenoline, methotrexate, oral contraceptives, myotics, argot, then methosaline, acutane, epinephrine, soraline, thiazides. These all drugs can cause cataract. When we specifically come to steroids, so they are the fourth leading risk factor for secondary cataract, they can be in the form of systemic steroid, topical steroid, inhaled or skin creams. Then coming to thiazolidin near dones, so new therapy of for non-insulin dependent diabetics associated with lenticular opacities. Amudarone, which is an antiarrhythmic subcapsular lens opacities and keratopathy is seen. Chlorpromazine, which is a neuroleptic and uh, neuroleptic drug leading to formation of anterior capsular lens pigmentation plus corneal endothelial pigmentary changes. Then myotics, thiagic thiophate, demicarium, bromide induce reversible anterior subcapsular granular type of cataract. Others like busulfan, gold, allopurinol, potassium, sparing diuretics, thyroid hormone, tetracycline, sulfamidase, tamoxifen, naphthalene, and simvastatin. All these drugs can lead to formation of cataract. The other toxins include like synthetic chemicals and pharmaceuticals. Example, acetone, dinitrophenol, chrysol, paradichlorobenzol, heavy metals like mercury, minerals like thallium, zinc sulfate, cobalt chloride, and sodium selenide. Then HRT, hormonal replacement therapy. Cataract is more common than men in the similar age due to hormonal difference. Estrogenic receptors have been detected in cataractous eye uh, lens which protect the eye from the cataract. Then we have alcohol consumption. Increased risk of nuclear cortical and posterior subcapsular cataract uh, is seen in people who consume alcohol. Lens is sensitive to oxidative stress and direct toxic effect alcohol itself. Radiation and electromagnetic waves. So, UV radiation directly linked to senile cataract. 
maximum length sensitivity is seen in UVB, which is wavelength around 300 nanometers. Prolonged exposure to infrared rays cause discoid posterior subcapsular opacities and true exfoliation of anterior capsule. Exposure to X-rays, gamma rays, neutrons may be associated with irradiation of cataract. So, um, in nutshell, I, uh, this table shows the various type of cataract and also what are the causes in the vulnerable people around. So, coming to congenital and developmental cataract, we have already discussed the fetal and in fetal factors and uh, maternal factors. So, it may occur since birth or from infancy to adolescence. Then, coming to senile cataract. Already we have seen that age itself is a risk factor along with that other things like dehydration, systemic disease, smoking, hypertension, they all contribute to progressing, early progression of cataract. So vulnerable group includes elderly people, mostly those who are over 50 years. Then traumatic cataract, which could be blunt trauma or a penetrating trauma with capsular breach, without capsular breach. But who are the vulnerable people? The people working in hazardous conditions such as welding or those with glass furnaces. Then complicated cataracts associated with eye disease or systemic disease, degenerative eye disease or inflammatory disease plus skin diseases. So patients with skin disease, allergy, uveitis, glaucoma, diabetes, they, emphysema, asthma, all are vulnerable. Then metabolic, so metabolic disorders, most commonly diabetes and galacto. Semia, so person deficient in certain enzymes oh, sorry, and hormones can are more prone. Toxic cataracts due to toxicants and drugs, we have already discussed in detail. So first, people on most commonly on steroid therapy. Steroid could be oral, systemic or in the form of uh, inhalers, creams, all these can lead to formation of cataracts. Then radiation and electrical, so infrared ray exposure, x-ray exposure, ultraviolet rays, powerful electric currents, all can lead to cataract. So people who come in contact with sunlight, artificial radiations are all vulnerable to development of cataract. Next, coming to cataract pathogenesis and clinical findings. So I'll discuss first, then we can come back to this slide. So lens anatomy. We have already revised in the previous uh, class, but we will discuss a bit of it. It is derived from the ectoderm. The lens is derived from the ectoderm. The ectodermal cells are surrounded by basal lamina and lens capsule. And superficial fibers of the lens are always metabolically active. Deep fibers are adult fibers. Glucose is the main source of energy used by these fibers to grow and become transparent. The aerobic reactions are responsible for 30% of ATP production in the lens and over 70% of ATP comes from the anaerobic glycolysis. Then there are four ion channels which are there to maintain the hemostatic and homostatic environment and this includes calcium ATPase and sodium potassium ATPase. Now coming back to these slides, uh, starting with the causes of the cataract, we have already seen that there are systemic diseases which are called cataract, most commonly metabolic diseases like diabetes then certain other systemic diseases like myotonic dystrophy then skin disease like atopic dermatitis neurofibromatosis wilson's disease they all lead to formation of cataract so these are systemic disease we also have local ocular disease like and degenerative inflammatory diseases which uh, contribute to cataract which include retinitis pigmentosa uveitis high myopia acute congestive angle closure hydrative fundus dystrophies so in diabetes, we have seen that there is increase in the glucose in the aqueous humor, which diffuses into lens and cause secondary osmotic overhydration of the lens, leading to opacification of the lens. Then other causes includes like ultraviolet light radiation toxin, leading to denaturation abnormal cell structure, which we will see in the further slide, increased density, stiffening and pigmentation of the lens material, leading to opacification of the cataract. Then third category includes trauma. So we have seen the blunt trauma or penetrating trauma or injury due to chemicals or ir irradiation all lead to formation of cataract. So these traumas usually lead to equatorial stretching and damage the lens capsule. Or if there is a history of previous ocular surgery, again there is risk of formation of early cataract. And congenital cataract is the hmm, one of the important categories. So cataract formation, as soon as the cataract is formed, there is loss of transparency of the natural cells leading to blurring of the vision. Then there is hardening of the central lens nucleus leading to decreased contrast sensitivity, increased refractive power and near-sightedness. 
leading to scattering of light, glare halos, difficult night vision. Then it leads to hypermature and large cataract. It can further block the iris trabecular meshwork and cause secondary glaucoma also. Coming, uh, studying detail about the pathophysiology. So most important factor is the free radicals. So free radicals, we already know, includes uh, hypochlorous acid, hydroxy radical, then free superoxide. These are constantly present in any living cell and are cause of oxidative stress to these cells. Also, there are repair system and scavenger molecules like reduced glutathione, cysteine, ascorbic acid, vitamin E, methionine, glutathione peroxidase, then thiol transferase, thiol redoxin, glutathione reductase are present. They work to remove the damaged proteins and nucleic acid. The most important molecule that works in the lens is antioxidant is synthesized and secreted by epithelium. So, glutathione reductase reduces DHA either directly or indirectly to TTS system. With age, synthesis and secretion of glutathione decreases, causing a progressive increase in glutathione disulfide levels resulting in oxidative stress. Higher level of oxidative stress will cause proteins to be thiolated by gamma glutamyl cysteine and cysteine. So, lens transparency. A vasculite of the fibers and thin interfiber spaces with regular organization of protein and cell is responsible for the transparency of the lens. Within the fiber themselves, crystallines are present in short range, which are shorter than the light wavelength, similar to glass. That is why lens is transparent. Within the lens cortex, high spatial order of the fibers and thin spaces play a significant role in enhancing the transparency. So these are the causes uh, uh, for why the lens is transparent. What happens? Uh, in cataract, the age-related change is causing cataract. So first is there is change in the physical behavior of the lens with the age. So continuous series of reactions and biochemical changes lead to stiffness and even coloration of the lens. These consequences affect the nucleus more than the cortex and they are the main reason that cause the loss of the lens accommodation. Then second thing which happens with age is increase in light scattering. As the age progresses and in the absence of cataract, the overall scattering of light increases steadily and this starts to be important after the age of 40 years. There is decreased elasticity. Elasticity and stiffness will become equal in both nucleus and cortex around the age of 40. But at 50 years, ciliary muscles become unable to modify the lens shape with their contraction. All these changes in stiffness and elasticity are caused by age progression that leads to change in protein concentration. Then there are changes in the lens protein itself with the age. So what are the changes seen in the lens protein? First is the post-transnational changes to the lens crystalline. It is a non-enzymatic modification of the crystallines. Change include modification of the structure of the protein into an insoluble structure of alpha and beta crystalline leading to loss of transparency. This occurs due to high sugar derivative, oxidation, denatured proteins and loss of antioxidants. Then second change which is seen in the proteins include conformational changes. Oxidative stress will result in formation of insoluble high molecular weight cross-linked proteins. Chromophores and AGs also contribute in crystalline modification leading to function and structural effect. Then there is loss of chaperone function. The activity of alpha crystalline chaperone significantly decreases with age. This is the reason of increased aggregation and insolubility of the proteins along with the increased increase of light and loss of transparency of the lens. The loss of antioxidants and free radical scavenging capacity. So reduced GSH level negatively correlate with age. A significant decline in cysteine in the lens nucleus is also observed. Therefore, all these problems become more vulnerable to oxidative stress. So, this was uh, about the physiology. So, we have already seen the etiology. We have seen the pathophysiology. Now, coming to the grading and classification system of the cataract, which is of clinical use. So, I will start with some history. How this classification started and what, which was the earliest classification. So, in 1986, Oxford Clinical Cataract Classification and Grading System was proposed. This system was based on composite slit lamp examination. The cataract features were classified morphologically 
and individual features are graded by comparison with the standard diagram. So there were no photographs, but they were standard diagrams. They were mounted adjacent to slit lamp. So what was the advantage of this classification? It was very detailed classification. As you can see, it included the various zones like anterior clear zone thickness was measured, anterior subcapsular opacity was measured, posterior subcapsular opacity, cortical spoke opacity, water clefts, vacuoles, retro dots, focal dots, nuclear brunescence, white nuclear matter, nuclear scatter. So, so many parameters were measured using a slit lamp. So, uh, as a result, and they were graded on a scale of 0 to 5. As a result, it was a very complex system and inter-observer variations were more. So, what were the limitations? It required a large number of character, uh, cataract characteristics. It was complex and inter-observer variation was more. So, next we had was Japanese Cooperative Cataract Epidemiological Study System. So, this is more of a epid for epidemiological studies. So, hence, uh, in this um, grading system, clinical photos of nuclear, cortical and subcapsular opacities. Only three things were considered. Nu uh, nuclear, cortical and subcapsular opacities. There was no direct slit lamp examination it, because it was for the epidemiological study. So, only the photos were collected and they were classified. It was proposed in 1990 and it was based on standardized image. So, it was designed for epidemiological study, mm, need to use standardized photos for reference and analyze multiple lens characteristics. Then another example of this simplified cataract grading system was an initiative by WHO, which will come in the uh, next slides. And their purpose was again to unify and simplify the criteria used in several other classification. Next came the Beaver Dam Eye Study. It study uh, this study is also called the Wisconsin, uh, uh, Wisconsin cataract grading system. It graded nuclear sclerosis only just the nuclear sclerosis from uh, on a scale from zero to five and cortical cataract in a sum of nine separate lens segments. So nucleus was graded from zero to five and the cortic cortex was divided into nine separate segments and they were numbered. So this Wisconsin cataract grading system is still used often at present when comparing clinically used grading systems with the new automated techniques in the cataract grading. Then came our favorite LOCS that is Lens Opacification Opacities Classification System. So right now I am talking about the LOCS 3. So this uh, system uh, was based on six lit lamp images of nuclear color and opalescence then five retroilluminated images of the ca uh, cortical cataract and five retroilluminated images of the posterior subcapsular cataract. So this is still considered the gold standard. It was introduced in 1993, comprehensive, detailed and simplified in comparison to the previous classification and it required reference photographs, but it was difficult to apply in clinical settings. So, starting with the history of LOCS, when LOCS 1 came, it was reliable and reproducible grading scheme. It was simpler for clinicians to use, accounting for important cataract characteristics. It was introduced in 1988. The LOCS 1 set out to classify cataracts using a slit lamp examination or with a slit lamp and retroilluminated photographs. So, here I am talking about LOCS 1. So LOCS1 just included the slit lamp examination and the retroilluminated, either the direct slit lamp examination or retroilluminated photographs. But there were no reference photographs. So evaluated the following, the opacification of the cortical and posterior subcapsular zone, intensity of opalescence in the nucleus, nuclear color and opalescence were uh, evaluated separately. Instead, clustered aggregation provided clinician a way to tell the patient that they have an early cataract independent of visual symptom. So, none of the classification till now have included the visual equity in diagnosis of the cataract. Then the LOCS2 was developed on the following year, improving on the LOCS1. So, LOCS1 was just observing the patient on slit lamp or having a photograph. There was no uh, nothing available for reference. 
So then came the LOCS2. So LOCS2 improving on the LOCS1 by implementing way to differentiate degree of cortical subcapsular nuclear opacification in addition to adding color photographs to be used as standard for comparison. So LOCS1 may there was a lot of intra-observer variations. So that is why um, they added uh, this color photograph for stand, uh, to be used as standards for comparison. Visual equity was still not uh, included in it. It was again left out of grading system. And there are other factors because they said that there are other factors that also contribute to change in vision. So that is why visual equity was not included in grading system, which could be unrelated to lens abnormality. Then LOCS2 demonstrated good intra-observer and good inter-observer agreements at the slit lamp and in photographic reading because they were standardized um, Photographs which are available for comparison, which were absent in LOCS1 and hence in LOCS1, intra or inter-observer variation was much higher. The slit lamp proved to be slightly more sensitive at detecting opacification than the photographs, likely owing to the limitations in photographic technologies at that time. Then came LOCS3. So LOCS3, LOCS3 expanded the scales which were used in LOCS2. And it is better to capture the early stages of cataract formation in the grading system. So the scale was enlarged. It was expanded. It examined the nuclear opacification, nuclear color um, on the scale of 1 to 6. So you can see in this uh, photograph also nuclear opacification and nuclear color was um, graded from uh, 1 to 6 on the scale of 1 and 6. Then... Uh, Cortical cataract on the scale of 1 to 5. So, cortical cataract were graded from uh, C1 to C5. And then there was posterior subcapsular cataract, which was scaled from 1 to 5. So, again, you can see in the lower down portion. So, posterior subcapsular cataract graded from 1 to 5. So, result, this resulted in increasing the sensitivity uh, as it was chosen as worthy reason for the change. This comparison marked an important change in welcoming the idea that photographic assessment could be superior to slit lamp examination. So in the previous uh, LOCS2, we have seen that the quality of the photograph was not good. But here they have said that photographic assessment could be superior to the slit lamp examination and perhaps creating a gateway to the digital analysis to provide a more objective measure of cataract than the subjective clinician assessment. At present, LOCS3 system is still used in varying degree in clinical practice. However, its clinical impact on decision making and time of surgery is still questionable. So we can once again see the LOCS3 which we have used the nuclear opacity and uh, nuclear color is uh, uh, graded from 1 to 6 scale. Cortical cataract in a retro illuminated image is graded from C1 to C5 on a scale of 1 to 5. Posterior subcapsular cataract again in a retro illuminated uh, image is graded from P1 to P5. So now, uh, as we have seen in the previous slide, the quality of photographs improved the clinical photograph. It improved from LOCS 2 to 3, but still they were lacking in that. So then came uh, various studies and there were various um, um, uh, experiments were done. So Hall et al. Uh, set out to provide a new way to visualize cataract. So they introduced laser slit lamp. So what is this laser slit lamp? It was an attempt to standardize an objective way to visualize cataract complexities. So the team created a device using a laser light slit. Laser light slit viewing arm with a beam splitter and a ch uh, charge coupled device camera to illuminate the anterior segment with the laser light. So they held a laser slit lamp where the laser light split slit was used as a beam splitter and also there was a charge coupled camera to um, capture the image. So these images were analyzed with computer program that calculated mean pixel intensity of the area of the interest in the nucleus. So this proved to be correlation correlated well with the LOCS3 grading scheme and demonstrated a linear relationship between the nuclear opalescence LOCS3 scores and the pixel uh, intensities imaged by laser slit lamp and analyzed with computer software. So these are the, some of the um, upcoming technologies which are there to analyze the cataract. This highlighted the use of computer program to assist the cataract grading.
then came uh, another um, uh, invention they set out to use computer generated analysis of the lens imaging to measure the uh, cataract severity in combination with the hmm, other things so uh, then fan et al created a method to grade nucleus sclerotic cataract it was based on the visual landmarks on the visual axis so you have seen in the the uh, in the first they have combined it with other qualities cataracts were combined with the other qualities fan et al they graded the nucleus sclerotic cataract based on the landmarks in the visual axis from the slit lamp photographs. Another group from John Hop Hopkins also used photographs for uh, visual axis and analyzed a variety of features. More features of the lens were analyzed and these methods, uh, a neural network was employed to analyze this image and produce a grade of nuclear cataract severity based on the lens landmarks which are noted in the visual axis. Then Xiong et al. Uh, suggested that retinal images could be used to create the cataract. So they employed a scale which was again used by Wang et al. Uh, to grade the blurring of the hmm, uh, retinal images. So when you have cataract, the retinal images blurs out. Now, based on that, they graded the cataracts. So previous work on this topic was already performed by Fourier analysis by Abdul Rahman et al. So their automated method of quantifying optical degradation in retinal image proved to be useful in detecting the presence of cataract and it again correlated well with LOCS3. However, automated grading of the cataract was not performed. So they were still just capturing the image, the retroilluminated image, but um, uh, the grading of the cataract was not performed. Additionally, vitreous opacity could not be evaluated separately as lens opacity. So just behind the lens, there is vitreous. If vitreous opacities are present, again, we cannot take a good photograph of the fundus. Na? But that vitreous opacities was still not evaluated separate, separately from lens op uh, opacities, potentially uh, influencing the grading. With these limitations in mind, Xiong et al. developed a successful method to detect vitreous opacity. And then they separated it from the retinal structure, detecting uh, detection so as to improve the cataract grading accuracy. So another method of Wong's method. So in addition to fundus photography being used as a novel method to grade the cataract, OCT was introduced. So uh, this OCT... Um, Wong thought to compare the anterior segment OCT nucleus density measurement with the LOCS3 grading. So LOCS3 is considered to be the gold standard for nucleopelsense and nuclear color. So they use the anterior segment OCT to grade the lens density, proved to be an objective, reliable and fast assessment using a frequently used clinical tool that requires a less training than mastering the LOCS3. So this was about LOCS and uh, some newer um, technologies coming along with the LOCS. We also have, uh, as I discussed earlier, um, WHO also gave a simplified cataract assessment grading system in 2002. But again, this was for a more of an epidemiological purpose. So this was very simple, com just comparing with the standardized photographs, separate grading of the nuclear cortical and posterior subcapsular was done. But there were no details and it was only designed for epidemiological studies. Then came the BCN-10. So BCN-10 used reference color images. It was introduced in 2017. And it was designed to predict lens hardness before surgery. So till now, we have just graded the cataract. We have not prepared ourselves for the surgery. That um, uh, how hard is the lens and what surgery is to be planned that was not included in any of the grading system. So BCN included the um, design to predict length hardness before surgeries. 10 grades of nuclear opacity were given and we also needed reference photograph. So this is the chart of BCN. So BCN grading system is provided in a A4 size laminated chart with high resolution photographs. So these photographs were taken by photography staff in Zeiss Litlam with the following settings. The system divides the nuclear cataract progression into baseline clear lens. So it starts from the clear lens and it grades up to 10. So N1 to N10. So this is the chart of the BCN. You can compare the photographs, the color of the opacity with the hmm, BCN chart. Then this degree of opacity is our grading scale unit. The grading system chart shows a large slit lamp cross-sectional image, a small frontal view image. 
and the relative color of each stage of capital development. The grades were chosen in equidistant interval from normal age crystalline lens to completely dark lens, cataracta, nigra is N10. So you can see there are two images. One is the slit lamp image and other one is frontal view image. And you can also see the um, change in the color starting from the clear lens to N10 that is the brunescent lens. And accordingly you can plan the uh, surgery depending on the hardness of the lens. Now the latest one is artificial intelligence. So we are talking a lot about these nowadays. So artificial intelligence is being used for imaging the technology and deep learning. It is based on automated optical imaging devices and need for high technology measurement. Many algorithms have been introduced, but there is no current gold standard. So what do we do in artificial intelligence? Like um, there is a screening which is done with various uh, instruments at the primary care center, which could be like slit lamp images or it could be an ocular fundus images. These are the inputs. Then you uh, feed these inputs in some neuronal networks like CNN and RNN. This RNN network is the full form is recurrent neural network. It is for the slit lamp image. And CNN is convolutional neural network. It is for the fundus image. So output, you can see the detection. Uh, it will um, find out whether there is cataract or not. If first it finds out whether the pupil is dilated or not, then it finds out whether it is a clear lens, it's a pseudophagic lens or there is a cataract. Once the cataract is diagnosed, then it will classify the cataract that how hard it is. And then the referring of the cataract is done based on this. So we have a very important algorithm, uh, ResNet DL that is deep learning algorithm with three step sequencing in diagnosing and referring. Uh, this algorithm recognized the different capture modes of slit lamp photography and classified the pupil as midriatic or non-midriatic, the area under the receiver's operating characteristic curve, then differentiated uh, between a cataract test lens on IOL or a normal crystalline lens, and this was followed by cataract CVIT grading and uh, determination. So, already there are so many studies going on, and uh, in China, they have even started using this AI in their uh, primary health centers. So this was uh, all about my topic. Uh, hope you understood <laughs> and got some new insights. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Pratiksha. That was a really wonderful talk and an exhaustive talk. And uh, there are so many aspects of uh, this topic that you have so wonderfully covered. So mm -hmm. Jaita, ma'am, any comments from your side? Yeah, I think there's uh, nothing much left now uh, since uh, Pratiksha has covered it so well. And I think it was I, it was a lot of learning for our uh, PG and DNB students. Uh, many new things were covered. I think especially, mm -hmm. Pratiksha, you have done a lot of uh, exhaustive research on the gradings of various cataracts. So any suggestions about where to read for our PG students? Where would you advise them to read this topic for or uh, any further readings? Any books yeah. or any journals which you would advise? Ma'am, the latest ones are already in general because they have still not come up uh, in various institutions as such. But there are so many studies going on in various countries and they are still at the um, developmental uh, level. So I think the latest, uh, these artificial intelligence and all are there in the latest journals and um, only in journals, not in books. And then rest of the history you can find anywhere. Hmm. I think, ma'am, AO, the American Academy of Ophthalmology, uh, uh, the various series that we have in that lens, uh, the the book that covers the aspect of lens also has a lot of details of uh, cataract, where, which can be read by students. Mm -hmm. So I would like to welcome our hot seat contestant, Dr. Purva. She is a postgraduate mm -hmm. at uh, Guru Nanakai Center, Malanazad Medical College. Dr. Purva, do you have any questions to ask from our uh, speaker? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, uh, like we were discussing about the use of AI in cataracts. So, uh, ma'am, uh, like in day-to-day -day OPD basis, can we use AI to our advantage uh, for diagnosis and further evaluation in our scenario, ma'am? Yeah, so as I have discussed it, uh, basically, AI in, includes capturing the image and then there are algorithms which analyze it. So they have introduced various apps also and various softwares which can be um, included in your smartphones. 
So when you click a photograph of the patient, you no sometimes you don't uh, some of in some of those apps or softwares you don't even need to like focus through speed uh, lamp. So you can just you can also make a video and it will capture the the lens only and it excludes the noise. So when we are at early stages and we have confusion of or if you are posted at some periphery and you have confusion you don't have any senior with you you can just capture that image and the um, uh, algorithm will or uh, determine whether there is cataract or not whether there is pc uh, whether it, it is just a clear lens or it's a pci also at various stages it will help also um, if like uh, nowadays we all are very interested in making our uh, surgical videos so this ai is even helpful in detecting the various steps and uh, uh, thus helps in annotations also which is a very tedious task so this ai is uh, like growing up every day helping budding um, uh, surgeons as well as the trained ones thank you ma'am uh, and ma'am also like you were mentioning we can record our surgeries so ma'am um, does it help us in uh, uh, finding out our weak points where we are going wrong is it uh, do we get a feedback no feedback uh, i am not worried about that because that is i don't think it will do the thing that okay. but i'm sure certainly Thank in the future you. it it will come about i mean there will yeah. be ai gui uh, guided uh, you know surgical tutorials yeah. made, uh, the uh, uh, this algorithms will guide you and at every step and uh, depending on, on the grade of cataract you know they will even set your parameters your machine parameters mm -hmm. and uh, they will tell you that you know this much time is required do this step and then this step like that so it it, it will yes, be sir. there in a big way also for oh, many yeah. of these uh, centers i think which are very far away and difficult for doctors to reach this will be a big help because yeah. you can screen for cataracts even doctors are not required i think uh, yeah. not medical people can also screen for cataracts mm -hmm. and refer patients very easily yes, like in pr primary health care centers we usually don't have ophthalmologists there so right. it can be of great help there <laughs> and even matlab people are working on it like i said in china they have even started using it yes, at the primary health care centers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. basically for periphery screening and mass screening where you want to do in camps for example you're doing it in a periphery in a village if you have such a uh, such a handy tool that with the help of a smartphone by capturing a photograph with the help of ai if you are able to diagnose whether the cataract is significant or not i think that will be a uh, that will be something really great because you know doctors are not always available in such situations to do the primary screening and if the machine takes over it's going to really reduce the workload of the doctors especially in peripheries mm -hmm. for mass screening that we're talking about in hospitals obviously the doctors available so you may not have much of a utility but in mass screening camps definitely uh, there's a lot of scope for ai to be working uh, dr pratiksha mm -hmm. i have one more question you know often in rounds we've been grilling the residents that you have patients of presenile cataract so any age that you uh, what age do you take as cut off for presenile cataracts for diagnosing that based on the like literature only i have read two there are two criteria some say it is less than 40 other say it is less than 45 so these are the two criteria that i know <laughs> yeah so basically mm -hmm. there are variable thoughts uh, as per literature some say 40 some say 45 and some may even consider up to 49 and 50 so uh, that is what we need to remember mm -hmm. so we know when to work up and investigate the patient further and exclude from the diagnosis of a senile cataract Uh, ma'am would you like to add uh, any more uh, points uh no i think uh, we have still 10 more minutes left uh i think i think we've covered a lot of uh, i mean most of the basics the etiology the pathogenesis uh, we've covered the classification in great detail we've covered so um um uh, anything about uh, this uh, you know lens induced uh, glaucoma and the and uh, anybody would like to talk about that the different types of uh, cataracts which can cause glaucoma like the because sometimes this is i think a quite a common question what are the differences maybe uh, dr purva you can answer this 
uh, what is the difference between phaco morphic phacolytic phaco anaphylactic all these different types of uh, um, some yes now i would like to add this uh, um first of all as we have seen that uh, in the pathogenesis of cataract what we see is in by uh, the lens imbibes water and uh, the lens protein opacifies and swells up so the increased thickness of the lens is responsible for the phacomorphic cataract it is based on the morphology of the cataract hence we give it the name now as the uh, cataract further matures and it becomes hyper mature cataract um, the lens capsule also develops micro leaks which leads to um, uh, export of the lens proteins into the um, uh, into our chamber anterior chamber which and the deposition of that material in a trabecular meshwork which can block the me meshwork and cause phacolytic uh, 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 glaucoma so what is the basic difference between phacomorphic and phacolytic on slit lamp uh mam on slit lamp examination in phaco uh, mam first of all the morphology of the cataract when we'll see we'll see a um rather thick and intumescent cataract uh, in phacomorphic and a hypermature morganian uh, sort of cataract or uh, uh, in phacolytic uh, glaucoma and ma'am also the uh, anterior chamber uh, yeah. it would be uh, shallow in phacomorphic glaucoma than in phacolytic glaucoma ma'am right uh, anything else what about the symptoms what uh, which patient would be more symptomatic uh, ma'am a patient of phacolytic glaucoma will be uh, more symptomatic uh, I think a phacomorphic will have a lot of pain, sudden onset of pain because the pressures will be very high. There will be uh, angle closure and the will be happy. Acute attacks. Yes. Yeah. I so think she just had a patient of phacolytic glaucoma admitted on her bed the <laughs> uh, day before yesterday. So she is yes, enthusiastic about phacolytic glaucoma. Okay, right. Another thing is pseudo exfoliation. I think uh, we should know a bit about pseudo exfoliation. Would any of the other... Uh, Participants, Dr. Ashwita or Ishita, anybody would like to talk about because it's a very common finding in your slit lamp. So, uh, any anything about pseudo exfoliation which you should be very careful about while operating a patient of pseudo exfoliation or anything else? I think the other participants are not connected at present. Okay, Purva, maybe you can. Uh... Uh, yes, ma'am. Ma'am, first of all. Uh... In pseudo exfoliation, is the basic etiology is that there's deposition of uh, fibrillary proteins on uh, uh, zonules on the capsule. So now, uh, while operating, the main uh, problem we can face is the zonular weakness. So now, uh, uh, so while uh, operating, we'll have to take the precaution that while we are fa doing phacoemulsification, while we are making the trench. And splitting, we uh, are doing. Uh, we are not maneuvering too much. Okay, ma'am. Also, uh, also the ma'am, uh, our uh, anterior capsule, um, it will have the uh, pseudo exfoliation material deposits. Uh, so, ma'am, the rexis can be a bit uh, tricky in that. Okay, so there are, uh, I mean, these uh, materials, they can be deposited in various parts of the eye, like yes, the yeah. starting from mm -hmm. cornea to the trabecular mm -hmm. meshwork, mm -hmm. uh, to the pupillary rim, the anterior uh, capsule. Um, again, yes, ma'am. So poorly dilating pupil again. Yes, uh, dilating uh, pupil. yes ma'am. There will be a high incidence of glaucoma in these patients. Mm -hmm. So you should mm -hmm. uh, you know, be very careful. And these patients, also in post-operative patients, many of them will have uh, maybe a dislocated bag later on. Many years later, they can have some dislocated bag or, a, uh, you know, IOL can drop into the vitreous cavity. So, uh, and many of them will have a, a progressive glaucoma as well. So, these patients have to be monitored. Mm. Yes, ma'am. I have one question for Dr. Pratiksha. So, ma'am, uh, usually LOGS is what is the standard of uh, standard classification system for cataract? 
but uh, that is often not available in the OPD. So uh, what grading system do you use in your OPD for grading of cataracts? Um, that says the ba on the basis of the coloration of the nucleus that we use. Huh? It's grade one, grade two, just the basis of the coloration, discoloration of the nucleus the, till the grade four. So and grade five is brunescent. Huh? Gray, uh, yellow, that's a simple. Amber and brown is what you follow. Yeah, that's a simple one. slit lamp classification that we use. Okay. And one thing, ma'am, I wanted to add, like I want to specify that I mentioned that some people have started grading uh, the lens on OCT, the anterior segment OCT. So there is one advantage that they have seen, as I was discussing with Dr. Jaita also, like in post-LASIK patients, when you grade uh, the cataract, for when you utilize o anterior segment OCT for a cataract uh, in post lasic patient so it measures both the anterior part of the uh, anterior curvature of the um, uh, this uh, cornea as well as the posterior then effective lens positioning ac depth everything in detail they have mentioned and they have even come up with new formulas like till now we were using like Hagee's, which was giving the perfect uh, answer to the il power for uh, post lasic patients but they are still coming up with the more um, reliable formulas using on the basis of uh, analyzing the cataract in post LASIK patient using OCT. So that is, again, I think is a <laughs> good coming yeah, up. That's very, I think it's very important because so many uh, patients will be post LASIK. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> very <and> soon. <laughs> so we should have, uh, yeah, I mean, that. I think it will be a benefit uh, and it will be quite accurate for uh, the IOL more calculation. Do you do anything special to be done in post like ICL patients for measuring IOL power? Post ICL, yeah, I'm not aware of anything specific. Uh, post ICL, uh, because um, the corneal curvature, etc., will remain the same. Nothing special. I think you have to follow just the routine formula based on what the patient's axial length is, and you go with a Barrett, and I think it's going to give you extremely good results. I've done a few cases with uh, IPCL explant and uh, cataract. We followed the Barrett, and that gives you equally good result as in routine cataract. Okay. Hey, Dr. Pratiksha, I can uh, see on the Facebook there are a few questions that have come up on the live view. Uh, so they're asking that uh, there are a lot of uh, factors that were discussed for development of presenile cataract and other risk factors for cataract. So in patients who are presenting with presenile cataract, what are the investigations that you routinely prescribe? Yeah, so... Um, before starting with investigation, you should ask the history. As I mentioned, most important, like in young patients, they have some type of skin problems and they keep on using some skin creams and even for like, um, like just for mild itching also, they keep on putting some over-the-counter drugs or drugs which they get from um, these pharmacists, pharmacies. They usually contain steroids. So in pre senile First of all, rule out this. So very important to take the history, whether you're taking the, any drugs, even um, like uh, boys who are going to gym, they take that supplements for bodybuilding. They also contain steroids. So first take a complete history and then we can go for uh, like um, investigation. So investigations include, again, you have to work up all autoimmune diseases because these diseases as well as the treatment of these diseases, they lead to formation of cataract because uh, ultimately, the, the drugs which are used in these diseases are steroids. So, all the autoimmune diseases and uh, a detailed history has to be taken. <laughs> and do you advise, uh, uh, in case you do not find a history of steroid use on other exposure risk factors, do you go for a serum calcium, vitamin D, and thyroid or parathyroid, other investigations in which no risk factor is found? Um, usually, I don't investigate these things. I just ask them whether there is any episode of severe illness, whether you had any episode of diarrhea or severe anemia or you were like prolonged illness. I just ask them because routinely I don't go for this calcium and uh, vitamin D and uh, thyroid to like um, very uncommonly related, but still uh, I don't prescribe these investigations as such. <laughs> Okay. Mm -hmm. I think history is something which is uh, very important. In very case. important. If we, if we go into detailed history, you are certainly going to find out one or the other risk factor. Mm -hmm. And if at all not available, then we can obviously uh, do a good clinical examination that can also help mm -hmm. us in finding out mm -hmm. if there's any systemic association. So I think uh, we have come to the end of this session. And... Uh, uh, 
just a minute. Okay, so I would like to invite our uh, viewers for the uh, physical eye focus class. Um, somebody from the IT team, are you available to share the flyer? Yes, dear doctor. Do you have the page available? Okay, so I would like to uh, invite all the viewers that we have the physical eye focus 2024 that is going to be conducted in Hyderabad. And it's going to be conducted in the month of June from 9 to 16. I think Dr. Hunavar has been doing a great job by conducting this physical eye focus uh, year after year since I think last 10 years. And since the registrations are limited and only 300 candidates are going to be registered for the course. So you can hurry up and register for the physical eye focus if you want to really attend this. So uh, thank you. With this, we come to an end of this uh, wonderful session and I would like to thank Dr. Pratiksha for the wonderful class that she has taken and uh, Dr. Jaita ma'am for sparing her time and being the chairperson for the session. And thank you Dr. Purva for being a part and uh, being having been grilled by all three of us for the questions. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you everybody. Thank, thank you Pratiksha for doing thank a good you. job. And thank mm -hmm. you Purva, you answered well. And of thank course you, you put a lot of effort I think for this presentation. So, many thanks.